Hi, I'm Wayne and this is Bastoa Woodworking. My first tool history video was fun and people seem to enjoy it, so I'm back with a second video in this series. This time we'll cover this tool which you surely recognize as a bandsaw. Bandsaws have become sort of a foundational tool across many different industries. They can be found everywhere from sawmills, wood shops, metalworking shops, and even butcher shops. But for the purposes of this video, we'll be specifically looking at the woodworking bandsaw. Now the bandsaw doesn't have the same controversial reputation among craftspersons as the radial arm saw, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have just as interesting and rich a history. I mean, it kind of does. But that's not the point of this video. This is a really cool machine, and it deserves a closer look. As they exist today, all bandsaws, regardless of brand, size, and intended use, the vast majority are comprised of the same essential components. You have upper and lower wheels on which the blade travels, and typically the bottom wheel is powered either directly via a motor to an arbor in the case of a direct drive saw, or by a pulley mounted to the bottom wheel that's driven indirectly by a belt attached to a pulley on a motor. The top wheel is usually free spinning, and it has a mechanism for tensioning and also tracking the blade. The blade travels on the crown of the top and bottom wheel and wood is moved along the table to cut it. We'll take a closer look at all of this stuff later in the video. And also you'll see on some smaller saws, you'll see a different variation of two, three wheels um, that are used to just kind of condense the, sh the footprints of the saw, but while maintaining this vertical cutting blade. Just like with the radial arm saw in the previous video, to examine the history of the bandsaw, we need to understand the function of the saw and how its job was performed before its invention. Nowadays, bandsaws serve a multitude of purposes in the typical wood shop. They're used for resawing, curve cutting, ripping, cross cutting, milling raw lumber. There are really very few cuts you can't make on a bandsaw if it's properly set up and you have the right jig. But all the same, let's briefly look at how these functions were performed before the bandsaw. This was the primary function bandsaw patents first tried to tackle. Sawmills used what were essentially large versions of frame saws. And then later, around the 1780s, you started to see what were essentially large circular saw blades to process timber into rough lumber. These were powered from anything from water wheels to internal combustion engines. There's no getting around it. Resawing by hand sucks. It can be stressful and tiring. It will make you question every bit of woodworking skill you ever thought you had, but that's how it was done. You would resaw a board into two using a ripping saw, and then you'd plane both sides smooth. Cutting curves were done in several ways, but mostly the craftsperson would use whichever saw could most accurately and quickly remove the most material such as a panel saw or frame saw, bow saw or coping saw. Um, they would then use a hand tool such as a spoke shave or a draw knife to refine the curve. Ripping could be accomplished in a few different ways, commonly done by hand using a handheld rip saw. Frame saws were a widely used tool for pretty much any cutting process that would fit between the sides of the frame. You could not only use it to rip lengths of board, but you could also use it to cut a shallow curve. Um, you could also use a table saw. These became prevalent in the late 1700s based on the large saws used in lumber mills. Not to retread the radial arm saw video, but cross cutting was accomplished primarily using hand saws as well as using the table saw.
This might sound like a cliche, but the bandsaw is an invention well ahead of its time, and in this case, I mean that literally. It was ahead of its time. You see, the bandsaw was invented in concept by William Newberry and received a, pa a British patent in 1809. I couldn't find a portrait of William Newberry, so here's a picture of a horse. Um, the machine could not be effectively produced for another 50 or so years. This was due to the impracticality of making the blade. No one could make a bandsaw blade that could withstand the constant strain and flexing that the machine required. And although there was no viable option for producing the blades, it was clear that the bandsaw was a good idea, and it was only going to be a matter of time before a viable blade option became available. To this end, there's no shortage of inventors clamoring to get a patent for different designs of a bandsaw across the world. It was Adam Stewart of Baltimore, Maryland to receive the first US patent for a bandsaw design, which was described as a belt or strap saw in 1817. The illustrations of this design were lost in a fire in the Baltimore Patent Office in 1836, but it was described by a magazine editor of the time as a two-wheel design which is not super helpful, but the editor did make a point to mention that he was not well acquainted with machinery in general. So that makes sense. What we would recognize as a bandsaw was first patented by Benjamin Barker of Ellsworth, Maine in 1836. However, it's important to note that these early bandsaws were more geared towards millwork and therefore were much larger than the bandsaws used in woodshops. Barker's design for a bandsaw used a 34 foot long blade that was 9 inches wide and a 12th of an inch thick and it rode on wheels that were 5 feet in diameter. The thought was that by having larger wheels you would reduce the amount of flex imposed on the blade. I don't know if this worked, I can't find any reference to a working prototype of Barker's design. Finally in 1846 or about 37 years after the original patent for a bandsaw, a viable blade was patented by a French woman whose name I'm about to butcher named Anne Paulin Crepin. Her design devised a method of brazing the ends of the blade together that allowed the blade to remain pliable enough to survive the constant flexing required. Crepin soon sold the right to manufacture these blades to Perrin and Company in Paris. Combining the steel alloys Perrin and Company had developed with Crepin's brazing technique, the modern bandsaw blade was created. The blade technology was the main thing holding the bandsaw back from widespread adoption through various industries, but it was only the first hurdle holding it back from reaching its potential. Once the blade was figured out and you saw some bandsaws actually being built and put to work, innovations on the design came rapidly to address shortcomings and to tailor its functionality across different industries. The bandsaw quickly became indispensable for not only lumber mills, but also furniture makers and craftspeople of all disciplines. This led to the saw becoming more and more common in Europe, and it was not long before the bandsaw made the journey across the Atlantic. Between the creation of the blade in 1846 and the first widely manufactured and advertised saw in the United States by a New York company called First and Priable in 1867, you'll see a bunch of patents for upper and lower blade guides, wheel numbers and orientations, blade shapes and designs, table systems and fences, as well as different ways to tension and properly track the blade. All of these innovations pushed the design and functionality of the bandsaw closer to what we would recognize today. And it's from this point that the history of the bandsaw becomes a little bit more foggy and convoluted with different patents being reissued while others expire, and new advancements are made to the designs here and there, but overall the history closely mirrors the history of what is sometimes called the Second American Industrial Revolution where you'll see the modernization and mass production of goods, appliances, and machines for both industry and home use. And bandsaws were among the first and most widely produced pieces of machinery marketed to small and home woodworkers. This is when you start to see the big names you'd expect to see in a tool history video like Craftsman, Delta, which this saw is a rip off of, um, Walker Turner. The, a lot of the brands that are still available to this day or can still be easily located on the secondhand marketplace. In short, there's not a hell of a lot that differentiates the modern bandsaw from a vintage one. Sure, there are some new features like tension relief levers for the blade, rack and pinion fence systems, and some updated safeguards like blade brakes and emergency stops, but a bandsaw from 1900 is very much the same tool as a bandsaw purchased new today. 
Just to reiterate from the beginning of this video and to go a little bit more in depth, pretty much all modern woodworking bandsaws share the same essential components and features. You have an electric motor that either directly drives a wheel or powers a belt that drives the wheel. The saw's speed can be adjusted by moving the belt into different positions on the pulleys, therefore adjusting essentially the gear ratio of the top and bottom pulleys. The bottom and top wheel are usually the same size. You can sometimes have different configurations using different size wheels. Um, those are few and far between, and for the purposes of this video, we're just going to ignore that they exist. Um, the wheels have a pad on them, which is called a tire. Um, the tire has a slight crown on it, which the blade rides on. The crown on the tire also allows you to index the blade on the wheels by using a tilt mechanism on one of the wheels, typically the top wheel. This is to ensure that the wheels are coplanar, which will allow the blade to run true. If the top wheel and the bottom wheel are not in direct orientation with each other, so coplanar, the blade will eventually work its way off of one or both of the wheels. The top wheel is also generally used to tension the blade by moving the wheel up or down to add or remove tension. Up adds tension, down removes tension. This is a very typical tilt and tensioning mechanism that you'd find on a lot of band saws from different generations. This knob right here affects the tilt of the top wheel this blade, this wheel knob here, will adjust the tension on the blade. It's very simple. You'll see two main styles of blade guides on modern bandsaws. You'll see bearing guides like these ones, and you'll see carbon block guides. The two styles are exactly what they sound like. This saw came with a blade guide that used carbon blocks. This one right here. But I've since upgraded to a bearing guide. Both types operate in much the same way by applying counterforce to the blade when pressure is applied to it. This ensures that the blade is not pushed off of its crown and maintains proper blade tension when cutting. There's a set of blade guides just like this above and below the table. The distance between the blade and the vertical pillar of the saw is called its throat, and it's by this measurement that band saws are sized. For example, this Harbor Freight band saw is marketed as a 14 inch band saw. This refers to the 14 inch between the pillar and the blade. This Craftsman 113 band saw is a 12 inch band saw, so it's 12 inches from the pillar to the blade. Very simple. As is the case with most tools that are worth owning, a bandsaw is typically upgradable, but throat size is something that can't really be upgraded on a bandsaw. So no matter how large of a riser block is installed in here, this will always be a 14 inch bandsaw. And this brings us to the second way that bandsaws are categorized, which is by capacity. This refers to the depth of cut a saw can make. On many bandsaws, the capacity of the saw can be increased by installing a riser block, as I've done on this saw. It adds roughly six more inches to the depth of cut available on this particular saw. This is an upgrade I would not, for example, be able to make on the Craftsman saw. As I hope has come across so far in this video, a well-maintained bandsaw is among the most useful tools you can have in a woodworking shop. I would go as far as to say that the bandsaw should be the first stationary tool a beginner woodworker should invest in. It can perform all of your basic woodworking cuts and has the added ability to resaw and cut curves. And they typically have a much smaller footprint than other saws with similar capabilities such as a table saw or a radial arm saw. And there are also some very capable benchtop models available for most budgets. Apart from their ability to perform most cuts a woodworker would ever need, by their design, they are thought to be a fair bit safer than other similarly sized saws, and this is for a few reasons. They don't present the same risk of kickback as, say, a table saw does, because the saw blade is constantly pulling down on the workpiece and pushing the stock down into the table, instead of pushing the stock back at you and up. The blade also has a smaller kerf, meaning you do not need as powerful a motor to power it. And in my experience, I have found that the bandsaw is a lot less intimidating to beginner woodworkers and is overall more cooperative for an inexperienced operator. The saw will, to an extent, allow you to safely back your way out of a cut before it gets too far away from you. 
and this part won't make sense to someone unfamiliar to a bandsaw, but the saw is easier to get a feel for. It's easier to read. You quickly learn the sounds and the feel of the saw, and it's easier to tell when the saw is happy and when the saw is for sure not happy. So you get kind of a feel for listening to the different sounds of the machine better than, say, something like a radial arm saw or a table saw. Now, none of this is to say that bandsaws are not dangerous. Like any other power tool, bandsaws are just as capable of causing injury, and sound safety practices are paramount in using them safely. Making sure that your workpiece is properly supported for the entirety of your cut is paramount to operating a bandsaw safely. Due to this perceived safety of the saw, people can sometimes fall into the trap of being too comfortable using this tool and can become complacent and try to make cuts that they really shouldn't and wouldn't if they did not have a false sense of security using the tool. I know that that kind of sounds con contrary to what I just said is all the benefits of the saw, but when you're actually using one, it will make more sense. <laughs> You'll see accidents happen when people try to cut curved objects on the bandsaw and where the bandsaw can grab the piece and rotate it out of your hand. And when this happens, it pulls your hands towards the blade, which is never ideal. So any piece that you cut on the bandsaw needs to be properly supported on both sides of the cut. Another reason a bandsaw may be a good choice for a beginner woodworker is a purely financial one. A good bandsaw is an investment. As far as stationary machinery goes, bandsaws are actually above average at retaining their value. I would say next to only a good drill press, a bandsaw retains its value very well, where you can typically find most stationary tools on the secondhand market for pennies on the dollar. For example, most of the machines in this shop were obtained for free by browsing Facebook Marketplace, but bandsaws are hardly ever given away. A huge disclaimer here is that this is only particular to my area. I've only ever lived in the Northeast of the United States, but this is what I have experienced in 12 plus years of scouring things like Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace looking for free tools. To kind of wrap things up, the bandsaw was an invention ahead of its time. The inventors knew this was a great idea, they just needed the means to build it. And once the technology of the time caught up to the aspirations of the tool, it never looked back and it's held a place in woodworking shops and is still a staple in the vast majority of both small and large wood shops. I cannot imagine any iteration of my shop that would not have at least one bandsaw in it. Thank you for watching. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to keep up to date with new projects as they are released. Comment down below with what tool you would like me to cover next. And until next time, thank you.